Um, I'm Kerry Dunn, the president of the City Bar Association, and I want to welcome you to this talk by District Attorney Cyrus Vance on the, quote, the conscience and culture of a prosecutor, which will describe uh, his office's conviction integrity program. So without further ado, let me introduce Cyrus Vance. Carrie, thank you very much. John, thank you for being here, too. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for taking time out tonight to, to be here. Uh, I have some family here uh, that I'd like to uh, acknowledge. Uh, it's good to see my father up there on the wall, making sure that uh, I'm uh, uh, keeping it straight and narrow. But I'm also joined here by uh, my wife, Peggy, and my sister-in-law, uh, and her daughter, Nora, uh, Jill, and Nora, who works at the Innocence Project and my daughter Claire, late, but she'll be here eventually. Uh, I really am grateful to be able to come back to the City Bar uh, to speak once again to its members, and this time to speak on a topic that has developed significantly uh, and tempered in light of my experience as District Attorney for the last two and a half years. As prosecutors, and I obviously started out as a prosecutor and am now uh, the elected prosecutor now, I, I believe that we have an opportunity to make a huge impact in the day-to-day -day lives of all the residents and citizens that we're privileged to represent. And I think it's unparalleled, the impact we have really in our profession. But the decision-making that we have is obviously not bound by single-minded wishes of a particular client as it was when I was in private practice. Instead, uh, in the familiar words of Justice George Sutherland in a famous case, Berger versus United States, uh, our interests in a criminal prosecution aren't that we win a case, but truly that we seek to achieve justice in the cases that we handle. But the question I ask is, what does it mean to say that justice has been done in any individual case? Uh, I believe we as prosecutors should be among the most skeptical actors in our criminal justice system about what that concept means and how our decision making as prosecutors gets us there. Otherwise, we risk the phrase doing justice devolving into empty words. And I've always believed this, but my perspective on this has truly been informed by the 20 years after I left the DA's office when I was a lawyer in criminal defense handling cases all around the country in state and federal court. Today, as a prosecutor and my prosecutors who work with me, uh, we are committed to guarding public safety zealously, but my own personal experience as a defense lawyer, and more generally, my experience as a member of this bar and other bars, has shaped my views on how to define the culture and conscience of a prosecutor's office as the district attorney. And that's what I'd like to talk with you about tonight. Every DA's office has its legends. And when I joined this office in 1982, the Wiley-Hoffert murder case was one of those. The case had been prosecuted by District Attorney Frank Hogan nearly 20 years earlier in 1963. And it was a notorious and it was a brutal murder case. Roommates Janice Wiley, who was a researcher at Newsweek magazine and a school teacher, Emily Hoffert, had been found stabbed to death in their apartment on East 88th Street here in Manhattan. Now, at the time, it was the early 1960s, and young professional women who were called career girls at that time were coming to New York in large numbers. In this case, the attack was savage. There was evidence that Ms. Wiley had been sexually assaulted, and the bodies were discovered by their roommate returning home one evening. And the roommate immediately knew that something was wrong when she entered the apartment, and perhaps it was simply the quiet in the apartment. And as she walked further into the apartment, she found her murdered friends stabbed collectively more than 60 times. This was every parent's nightmare, and the public uproar over those murders was intense. These crimes went unsolved for months, until the police arrested a man in Brooklyn on an unrelated case, but who in the process of that arrest gave a detailed confession to these crimes. The man's name was George Whitmore, he was African American, and he was unemployed. District Attorney Frank Hogan filed an indictment against George Whitmore for those crimes. But after the indictment, Hogan began to have his doubts about the confession. It turned out Mr. Whitmore had a mental disability, 
And despite having a defendant and a confession in a high visibility and high pressure case, Hogan launched a far-reaching reinvestigation, an investigation that ultimately led to that defendant's exoneration and dismissal of the indictment in 1965. The point of this story? When I arrived as a young assistant DA in 1982, young attorneys were told that the wiley hofford exoneration represented the highest traditions of our office. And in fact, even before we joined the office, we were told in our office's recruiting materials and throughout the interview process that the job of an assistant district attorney was not simply to seek convictions, but to seek justice. When I returned as district attorney in 2010, I intended to build and continue these traditions of fairness and integrity that frankly had defined and distinguished this office in the hands of my predecessors. And I'd like to share with you how today in our office we face some of the hard questions of conviction integrity, legal ethics, prosecutorial discretion, and ultimately fairness to the accused. Now our office in Manhattan is different from most state prosecutor's office in some regards. We have an exceedingly high volume of cases, more than 100,000 a year. And the variety of matters that we prosecute, including murders, sex crimes, financial crimes, and cyber crimes, uh, notwithstanding that variety, the core questions that we face in defining our prosecutorial conscience and culture are much the same as those faced in any prosecutor's office anywhere in this country. Questions like, what does it take to go forward with a case? Is it different for the initial charging decision versus a decision to take the case to a jury? When does justice require us to dismiss a case? What is the interplay between a jury verdict of guilty and a credible post-conviction claim of innocence? You know, interestingly, the answers to these questions, not a single one of them, are found in the law. And they're not even found in our ethics rules. Instead, they are defined by values of conscience and culture and a healthy skepticism about what it means to do justice in any given case. But as all of you know, more and more in this century, our prosecutorial choices are informed by science. And indeed, any discussion we have about the role of a modern prosecutor's office can't proceed very far without addressing the revolution wrought by the extraordinary reliability of DNA evidence and more broadly, the rise of the exoneration movement. DNA exonerations have had an impact that reaches far, far beyond giving a falsely convicted defendant his or her freedom. They have shown all of us that an innocent person can land in prison despite the best efforts of a prosecutor, a judge, and a jury. The stakes here are obviously very high for innocent defendants who have been wrongfully convicted and for victims who want finality in the face of a conviction and for the legitimacy of our criminal justice system as a whole. And for this reason, I believe that prosecutors must join other leaders in this arena to examining closely what can lead to wrongful convictions and to take steps to minimize the chance that they occur. And our answer when I took office in 2010 was to establish the Conviction Integrity Program within the Manhattan DA's office, a step that was unprecedented for a New York State prosecutor's office at that time and with only a free few previous efforts having been made like it ar around the country. Today, it's led by Senior Assistant District Attorney Bonnie Sard, who would be here tonight, but she's on trial with a murder case. And she serves as the chief of the Conviction Integrity Program. Our program has two main parts. First, with what we sometimes call the front end. After much study and evaluation, we put in place new procedures, policies, and training to further guard against prosecutorial misjudgments and wrongful convictions. And second, on what we call the back end, we instituted a program to review convictions and occasionally pending prosecutions in which the defense has raised claims of actual innocence. Now, I'd like to start by talking first about the front end, preventing wrongful charging decisions and convictions. And we began in our office by assembling teams of some of our most thoughtful and experienced assistant district attorneys in the office and we also have relied upon a panel of outside advisors, including Barry Sheck of the Innocence Project, former U.S. Attorney Zach Carter, retired New York Court of Appeals Judge Howard Levine, and Fordham Professor Bruce Green. 
This outside panel doesn't advise on particular cases, but advises us on best practices. And we asked these two groups to address particular issues identified in nationwide analyses of exoneration cases. And the teams addressed areas such as eyewitness identification, use of jailhouse informants, interrogations, confessions, evaluation of police testimony, and preservation and disclosure of evidence that is favorable to the defendant. Two different groups, inside and outside experts, work together to examine best practices in these areas that have been documented of concern around the country. And among other things produced by these two teams, each provided us with a series of uniform questions to help systematize our initial case analysis. For instance, in eyewitness testimony cases, particularly those involving one witness, uh, our guidelines now direct our assistant district attorneys at the outset of the case to specifically analyze certain factors to make sure that an analysis is uniform across the office. For example, a witness's opportunity to view the perpetrator during the time of a crime. It directs the prosecutor to preserve the witness's first written or oral description of the perpetrator and to investigate in detail any photographic or corporeal identification of the defendant. And the guidelines encourage our assistants to find independent evidence, such as cell phone tower records, that might place the accused either at the scene of a crime or that might help to establish an alibi. Similar directives guide assistants in our office in determining whether they are fulfilling their obligations to disclose favorable information to the defense. And certainly, most bureau supervisors now review the answers to these core questions with ADAs at a fixed point in the life of a case before trial. Now, the front end of our Conviction Integrity Program isn't just limited to checklists and to paperwork. We've added a Conviction Integrity component to each of our major training sessions. So, for example, young assistants receiving training on grand jury practice, or, for example, in the handling of domestic violence cases, will be trained on ethical issues relating to those specific practice areas. And another practice that we have established and formalized, which has been very successful, is to hold roundtables for major or complex cases. So before presenting these kinds of cases to the grand jury, in homicides and other major cases frequently, these are presented to a small group of assistant DAs who thoroughly help to vet the facts and investigate the steps that have been untaken, undertaken in that case. The idea behind these are all very, really very simple idea. Uh, reduce the risk of prosecuting the wrong person and strengthen cases where we believe we have identified the actual perpetrator. So the question we ask then is do these new protocols work? And I certainly believe so, although one challenge I will tell you thus far has been devise a metric to answer that question with data. But one thing I can tell you is already clear. The very process of examining our procedures, of trying to articulate and to synthesize our best thinking, and to put it in front of our assistants in a systematic form has been critical, we believe, to the evolution of the conscience and culture of our office. It is now part of the way in which we transmit our values to new prosecutors in our office. And it reminds all of us at a very practical level of what are otherwise high-minded ideals, that our duty as lawyers, as prosecutors, is to do what's right in every case that we have before us, wherever that leads. But I believe careful prosecutors must go even further to satisfy themselves that they are doing right. Because we know that sometimes even conscientious prosecutors get it wrong. One lesson that we've all learned from the exoneration movement is that relatively few unjust convictions are the result of blatant prosecutorial misconduct. Now, all those, although those cases make headlines and understandably spark public outrage, they mask a much, much more complicated challenge. Far more wrongful convictions, I would warrant, come from well-intentioned prosecutors who may have failed to investigate a lead or were insufficiently skeptical of a witness's testimony. So today, when we speak of the conscience and culture of a prosecutor's office, we've learned much from our own examination of best practices, and we've learned from the work of the exoneration movement. And we believe that a healthy skepticism, good, sound procedures, and an appreciation of the history of what may have gone wrong at times in the past are today, as prosecutors, our best protections against the possibility of convicting the innocent and the surest path for us to ensure the integrity of our convictions. But let me turn to concrete cases in which typically a defendant who has been convicted raises a new claim of actual innocence. 
This is what we call the back end of our Conviction Integrity Program. And we have put in place a procedure by which every post-conviction claim of actual innocence we receive is also subject to a standardized review, beginning with a case review by the Chief of the Conviction Integrity Program, who reports directly to me. If she believes there is no miscarriage of justice, nor otherwise a need for further investigation, she forwards her recommendation and conclusions to me, and I review it, I speak with her, and I may or I may not agree with her. If she believes that a reinvestigation is appropriate, it's a decision that I don't second guess. And we re reassign that case to an assistant district attorney other than the one who originally handled the case. And that reassignment carries with it absolutely no implication that the original assistant committed any impropriety whatsoever. And one reason we established this protocol regarding reassignment was precisely so that no one could read into the reassignment any criticism of the original prosecutor. That new attorney will conduct a thorough de novo reinvestigation of the case and will report his or her conclusions and recommendations to our inside conviction integrity panel consisting of the dozen or so senior assistant DAs that also worked on building our front end protocols. Together with the chief of our unit, that panel makes a recommendation and ultimately it's presented to me. When we first instituted our conviction integrity program, it was this reinvestigation component that gave us the most concern. And we worried first that some assistants might chafe at the prospect of their colleagues looking over their shoulders to investigate claims of innocence or impropriety, claims that frankly, in the overwhelming majority of cases, turned out to be meritless. But we worried too about whether an assistant would feel inhibited by conducting a full-scale reinvestigation of the work of someone who may be a longtime friend or a trusted colleague. And I'm happy to report today that the office culture, I believe, is committed to this endeavor and that those fears that we anticipated simply have not materialized. A typical reinvestigation begins by reviewing the evidence presented at trial. Then we locate witnesses for interview and re-interview wherever they may be, with a particular eye toward trying to identify any witnesses who might have been overlooked in the original investigation or who might only have come to light post-verdict. We seek out any new sources of physical or documentary evidence or forensic, forensic evidence. We offer to meet with the defendant and his or her attorney for an interview. But that description of our process leaves unanswered one big question. After we've reinvestigated, after we've assembled all the evidence, how do we decide whether or not to vacate a conviction? That question is a daunting one, and it's so daunting that the temptation is to invoke here our lawyer's default answer that it depends on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, but I'll resist that temptation, that temptation tonight with you. Uh, our conviction integrity program has been in place long enough that some general principles have emerged principles which can guide our work going forward and which I'd like to share with you. The first general observation is one that really surprised us. Of all the claims of innocence that have been presented to our Conviction Integrity Program since it began more than two years ago, and that's roughly 118, not a single claim, zero, could be resolved one way or the other by DNA evidence. Either no DNA evidence existed or the available DNA evidence was not dispositive of guilt or innocence. And that makes our determination more difficult, but it in no way diminishes its importance. We don't stop our analysis simply because there is no single crucial dispositive piece of evidence. Indeed, after a great deal of internal debate, we decided that not even a plea of guilty will preclude full, consider full consideration of a claim of actual innocence that comes to our office if there is a plausible concrete reason for the plea of guilty and an evidentiary claim that seems worthy of investigation. So that leads us to the question of what weight to accord a jury verdict of guilty in our analysis. And I don't pretend for a moment that we've devised a simple formula in this regard. But I will say this, if in reviewing a case we have access to critical, newly discovered evidence that the jury didn't see, or if we have found some fundamental defect in the trial itself that suggests the jury did not have a fair opportunity to evaluate the evidence, then we need to look at the verdict with fresh eyes and ask whether, in fairness, it can stand. And when we doubt that it can, we should, and we have, 
move to vacate the conviction. But when we are looking at essentially the same evidence the jury saw, and where the trial seemed to us to have been conducted in a fair and competent manner, we are very strongly disinclined to vacate a jury verdict of guilty, even if we, in hindsight, believe that we might have reached a different verdict. The reality that we have encountered in our Conviction Integrity Program, in which virtually no case is solved by, dis by dispositive scientific evidence, has led my staff and me to re-examine the first principles that guide our culture and conscience as a prosecutor's office. And let me give you a couple of examples that illustrate that process. Among the most difficult cases that we as prosecutors confront are those in which a witness's credibility is so compromised that it becomes difficult to draw a reliable conclusion one way or the other regarding whether a crime has been committed. Even today, in this era of seemingly ubiquitous security cameras, cell phone videos, and trace forensic evidence, there are still many cases that reduce to a contest of credibility or that rely on the abilities only of human perception with little or nothing to corroborate or contradict either account. So what does conscience command in such cases? What's our yardstick? Last summer, in determining that we should dismiss charges against Dominique Strauss-Kahn, I stated my belief that we should not proceed to trial with a case unless we, as prosecutors, are convinced ourselves beyond a reasonable doubt of the defendant's guilt. Now, this isn't a truism. Under New York's legal ethics rules and those applicable in almost any other jurisdiction, charges may be brought against a defendant and a defendant tried if they are supported by probable cause. And under our ethics rules and laws, it is perfectly legal for a prosecutor to say, I won't substitute my judgment for that of a jury. If there's probable cause to bring a case to trial, I'll do so and I'll let the jury decide. But we approach this process differently. In the initial charging decision, certainly, probable cause is sufficient to initiate and proceed with a prosecution. But before proceeding to trial, I believe prosecutors in our office should themselves be personally convinced beyond a reasonable doubt of the defendant's guilt. Put simply, but differently, if we're not convinced beyond a reasonable doubt of, that the defendant is guilty, how do we go into court and ask a jury of 12 to find him guilty? Now, any investigation may uncover outrageous immorality and mounds of suspicion, but when investigative work up until trial fails to produce convincing evidence of guilt, I believe we should not proceed, regardless of any public pressure to move ahead. Not surprisingly, such cases compromise one of the most difficult parts of our work. Nonetheless, making those tough decisions, I believe, defines the conscience and the culture of a prosecutor's office more than any conviction reported on the front page of a newspaper. On the other hand, I believe we have to be fearless in moving forward with those cases that we believe in, even if the prosecution is unpopular or even unlikely to result in a conviction. And in these cases, conscience tells us we must go forward. Many, many are the times that prosecutors in our office enter a courtroom, and former prosecutors who've been in courtrooms themselves uh, who are here tonight, knowing that the odds are stacked against them as they move the case toward trial. Maybe it's a case of gang violence in which the victims and their families are terrified of testifying, or it's a case involving organized crime where the victims are as unsavory as the perpetrators. Or maybe it's a case like one that two of our assistants handled just last year. One afternoon, an attendant in a nursing home in Upper Manhattan walked into her patient's room and she saw another male attendant on the bed of a stroke survivor. The male attendant had his pants down and was sexually assaulting the patient. But the case was a very, very difficult one. The victim, the patient, was a senior, and she was partially paralyzed and unable to speak. The attendant who witnessed the crime was so unnerved, she didn't report it for 24 hours. And when she did, the male attendant denied everything. And by that time, there wasn't any physical evidence to confirm the witness's story. And in fact, the patient, the stroke survivor, was so terrified of reprisal that when she was examined at the hospital, she indicated that nothing had happened. Attorneys in our sex crimes unit reviewed all the evidence. They went to the nursing home to meet with the victim. They spent hours 
looking at this case, and they became convinced of the defendant's guilt, and they believed they could prove the case at trial. So they sought an indictment, refused a plea bargain, moved the case to trial, and at that trial, this elder victim, speechless by virtue of her disability, testified in court by pointing to letters and words on a board in the courtroom. The jury retired to deliberate, and with surprisingly few interruptions for rereading of testimony, came back with a verdict of guilty. And I mention this case and these cases because I think that they illustrate more eloquently than my words ever can the conscience and culture of our prosecutor's office and many around the country. On the one hand, we need to be fierce advocates and protect victims of crime, sometimes against great odds. Yet, as we all know, prosecutors have a broader set of unique obligations to the community, the victim, and to the defendant. So when we exercise our power, it has to be done responsibly, and I believe with a sense of humility. And that may require us to dismiss charges, no matter the public outrage, and promise to proceed. And this, I believe, is justice under anyone's definition. Or in Justice Sutherland's words, this view fulfills our twofold aim that guilt should not escape nor innocence suffer. Ultimately, what doing justice means is entrusted to our sound conscience, and we try to do what we believe is right in every case and in all of our decisions. Those are the values I learned in the DA's office more than a generation ago. Those are the values that I sought in a prosecutor's office when I represented a criminal defendant. Those are the values I believe all of us in this room share as stewards of our criminal justice system. And those are the values I hope to carry with me in the office as I go forward as the district attorney. So thank you very much. John, I'd be happy to take questions.